Welcome to the Austin Forum Upload. I'm Jay Boisseau, the director and founder of the Austin Forum on Technology and Society, and we're really pleased to get back to the Austin Forum Upload podcast. We apologize for the long break we took in the fourth quarter of last year, but we have lots of good topics and speakers queued up for the quarter ahead. So we promise we'll get back to that weekly and maybe even then some. There's lots to talk about, but we're going to start here at the beginning of 2023 by talking about chat GPT, the technology that everyone is talking and writing about, in particular, how well it can write various things. So to talk about this today, I'm very pleased to introduce my longtime friends and colleagues, Adnan Khalil and Luke Wilson. So Luke, Adnan, thanks for joining us. Good to be back. Good to be here, uh, Jay. It's, It's a pleasure. All right, I'm going to have each of you just share with our listeners a real quick bit about your interest and experience in AI. And Luke, let's start with you. Sure. So I've been working in AI for you know nearly 20 years, um, all sorts of different techniques, you know, genetic algorithms and uh, neural networks and whatnot. And um, prior to my current job, uh, I was at Dell um, as a distinguished engineer for high performance computing and artificial intelligence, working on developing large-scale uh, AI models using neural networks. So this is a uh, particular interest to me. So yeah, Jay, you know, I've been also looking at neural networks for a very long time. I sort of looked at it as part of my my master's thesis, you know, 20 years, 20 plus years ago. Uh, and I've been sort of revisiting it ever since then. Lately, you know, I've... Uh, been really interested in the hardware aspects of uh, AI accelerator design and, you know, the various ways you can design it. But, you know, this is something that um, it's it's always at the top of my mind in one form or fashion or the other. And, uh, you know, graph algorithms, neural networks, you know, they all seem to be coming back uh, in vogue. So. And you guys brought up a couple of great points. One is you've both been doing AI for a long time. And two, that AI, the ideas around it, have been around for a long time. And that's important, even though everybody's you know excited about chat GPT now, it's important to know that this builds on a long body of work in this field and that other things like having enough data and enough computational power have enabled us to realize things that people have been wanting to achieve for quite a long time, actually. Um, let's start with a working definition of AI and machine learning. And Luke, I'm going to start again with you on this one and let Adnan add to it. Do you want to give our listeners a a, a short, concise, working definition of AI for the purposes of explaining chat GPT? Sure. So I think think probably the easiest way to think of artificial intelligence is a machine-generated response to a set of perceptions or inputs or stimuli. And this this re, this reaction that is given to the set of stimuli is mathematical in nature. So it's it's the idea of making an understood response based on a set of input conditions, just like we do with a function or anything else in computer science or mathematics. It's just that it's much more complicated than you know creating a function that says two plus two equals four. You know, you have bigger inputs, more complex inputs, less well understood inputs, uh, and then you produce an output from it. All right. I, I think, Luke, you kind of gave the 201 definition. I'm going to ask Adnan to make an even simpler definition for the 101. Yeah. So, you know, uh, AI is, is, is really a way of having a computer come to a conclusion on, you know, on, a, on questions based on data that it's, it's looked at before. You know, it can. One thing we know that computers are really good at is analyzing lots and lots of data. Now you can use that data and use, uh, you know, use the information contained within that data to make predictions about what, you know, uh, a similar input might have uh, an answer for. So I think that's a very simple definition of of AI. Is essentially it takes you know, lots and lots of data, and you can use it to make inferences or judgments on on a new set of data that somewhat matches what you've trained that that machine with. That's great. I'm going to 
use give my own working definition here and try to use elements of what both of you said in that. Um, Luke emphasized that this is based on mathematical operations. That's an important thing to understand. We're training these AI models on data using math. These models don't inherently know Shakespeare or what a dog looks like or things like that. We train it on digital data representing any of these things. It can be text or image or video or sound. It can be time-dependent data that shows progress, uh, very useful in training them to make predictions. But it must be trained on data. And if the data is good, it may be able to do things like classifications and judgments and predictions for similar scenarios that are very good, and even be able to generate new content, but new content that looks like the content it's been trained on. It doesn't generate wildly divergent content, although, of course, you can make an application that also does that. But from an AI perspective, it is trained on data, and it can do really incredible things with enough training on enough data. Um, so with all that as pretext for this, um, what is chat GPT and how does it diff how is it different from AI apps that recognize images and create music? Ed, then I'm going to start with you on this. So, you know, in many ways, this is really an extension of, of work that's been done actually over the past three or four decades. In fact, you know, many of you who've been in this field might remember this application called uh, Eliza, which was the first sort of chatbot, right? I mean, you you asked it a simple question. A lot of the times it would just sort of reverse it and ask it back to you, but it was enough of a context that made it sound intelligent. Now, you know, and that sort of progressed and you had chatbots, which incorporated more text, grammar, meaning, maybe some, some, you know, some more sentence construction and so on and so forth. Now, what's really changed, I think, with chat GPT is that uh, the neural network models that power it have grown incredibly complicated to the point where, you know, you have billions and billions of nodes and and Jay and, and Luke, you can talk about what, you know, with these, why these nodes are there or, you know, what's, what's the relevancy of them. But each one of these nodes uh, sort of handle one aspect of how information may have led to a conclusion or a decision point. But anyways, so, you know, ChatGPT has like 1.75 billion parameters, which are used- 175 to billion. 100, uh, yeah, 175 uh, billion parameters. And each one of them, you know, has like some information on the nuance of, of language and construction and what people have talked about and all of the data that, you know, they've, they've fed into the system. So, so that makes it incredibly, you know, um, it, it, almost intelligent in a way that it can seemingly do tasks which were almost impossible until like a few years ago, like write in a particular style or even form an, uh, a semi-cogent argument based on some facts that it knows about. So. so Luke, what do people need to know about the origin and nature of what makes up chat GPT? Well, we'll start with uh, just breaking down the name because, you know, the, the great thing about the AI field is that, you know, the researchers in, in the AI space love to use acronyms that no one else understands. And then they get picked up by the media and, they get repeated without anyone knowing what they actually are. So GPT stands for um, uh, Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And so chat is um, one particular application of this, you know, uh, Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And, and a Generative Pre-trained Transformer is a type of neural network. It's a transformer neural network that's been pre-trained with a set of inputs in, in the case of chat GPT. It's actually basically all the content that's available on the internet. And we can argue all day long about whether or not that's really a quality training data <laughs> set or not. Um, and it's generative in that it generates, it's not just a decision network that makes a an, a single de uh, a decision inference. It, it's a generative network that's producing text or other types of content. In the case of chat GPT, it's producing text because it's intended to be um, a chat uh, interface, you know, you provide, you ask a question, it will provide a response in the same way that a typical chatbot would, but with far more sophisticated set of um, basically fuzzy rules that it uses. Typical chatbot that you interact with on a website or in a bank 
or something like that. It is pre-trained to look for particular words. It's looking for, for keywords or hot words or phrases or things like that. And so it can give you a canned response. Chat GPT is really looking at generating patterns based on expectation. Um, so it can give, you know, types of text, types of uh, responses that match a particular pattern that you want it to give, like a news article or a poem or a piece of code, um, and then trying to put the, rele the, the relevant information into that at the same time. So it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing tool. It's an amazingly complex piece of, of uh, you know, software, but um, but that's what it really is. It's just a a generative model that's designed for chatting with people. Uh, great. Now I'm going to add a little bit of color to what you both said here as well. I do want to start by giving credit to OpenAI. OpenAI is the company, formerly a nonprofit, now a for-profit company that has made this available. And all of you can go on to the web and find ChatGPT at OpenAI's website and actually use it to do some of the things that we're going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, so OpenAI is the company that is the creator and released chat GPT chat GPT as Luke said, is based on a generative pre-trained transformer model called GPT three and GPT three was trained as Adnan said on 175 billion parameters, essentially all of the text on the internet. And that includes not just prose, but lyrics to songs, poems, everything that's out there went into the training of this. Um, and another term that our listeners might hear sometime is large language model or LLM. Uh, that's important because as Luke was referring to earlier, um, this is mathematically very complex, but that complexity enables it to find additional patterns and correlations and insights in the data. So the fact that chat GPT is based on a GPT version that was trained on 175 billion parameters, that's astounding. And in fact, the model growth has been 10x a year over the last few years. And the future GPT-4 to be released in a few years is expected to be trained on 100 trillion parameters. So as good as it is now, um, it's just going to get even better. Um, but what do I mean by that? So let's talk about some examples of what it can do. Let's bring it home for the listeners. So they, if they go to the web after this and uh, open up chat GPT, what are the things it can do for them? Well, it can do all sorts of different things. You know, you can, you can ask it a very general question. Um, you know, I, I would like um, something in a particular style on a particular topic and it will try and fill in the gaps um, using context, contextual words from that particular topic space that you asked it about in a particular style that you asked it about, and it'll generate that, that content. And so if you ask it to, and um, kids, if you're listening, don't get any ideas. If you ask it to write <laughs> a, a term paper on, you know, the Lincoln Douglas debates, it will attempt to um, generate at least a couple paragraphs of, of information, if not more, based on that, you may have to continuously prompt it for more information in order to get multiple paragraphs out of it. Um, um, so you don't get out of doing all of your work, you still gonna have to come up with a top level summary and slowly generate that content. But, um, or, or if you ask it, for example, to generate song lyrics, um, you know, in the style of, you know, a particular artist, it will attempt to do that as well based on a particular subject. So if you wanted to build, you know, um, a song that sounds like it's sung by uh, your, your favorite artist about, uh, you know, no and low code comp uh, coding techniques, I'm sure it would try and come up with something like that. I don't know if anyone would want to listen. But uh, yeah, so that's what it really what it does. It's taking it's taking a set of um, keywords about a particular topic and it's putting them in the the format or the context or or uh, style that you request. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a really important point. I, uh, I I actually showed this to my daughter and her friends this morning, uh, and they had not really used it, and they were fascinated by this. And the first example they said is write a script for an Olive Garden commercial that is sassy and family friendly. And I'll be darned if it didn't write what looked just like a script, including notes for when the server approaches the table and things like that. And what each of the four, it decided to come up with four friends sitting at the table and one server. 
and one narrator for the end of the commercial. It was it was stunningly good. And then, of course, they um, said, well, how about write a song in the style of Taylor Swift? And they got lots of giggles out of that because it absolutely sounded like the lyrics of a potential Taylor Swift song. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's amazing what this program can do. And I think it's going to continue to sort of amaze all of us. But I think going back to what Jay pointed out earlier, ultimately, you know, the computer has no context. It doesn't know a cat, a dog, an elephant from, you know, a virus or a plant or anything of that sort. And as long as some information exists in its database that it's been trained with, and it has some way of connecting the dots, it'll do it really well. Sometimes it'll do it too well to the point where, you know, if you've got a, a corpus uh, of literature which talks about maybe some opposing points of view, it might even skip some of the opposing points as it's trying to construct a narrative that fits the question that, you know, you have asked it to do. And, that, and therein lies, you know, some of the problems of chat GPT. It, it can produce text which looks very coherent and cogent, but sometimes it may not logically follow what we as humans almost take for granted, or you may have some knowledge on the topic and you'll be like, hey, this doesn't make sense. Yeah, Adnan, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to move into the limitations and weaknesses. And it's it's important that as we're all wowed by what chat GPT can do, that we're aware of its weaknesses and its limitations. And I think one of the biggest limitations I've heard so far is that it sounds incredibly confident, even if it's mm -hmm. wrong. Right. So uh, it's a it's a possible uh, creator of misinformation as well. But, but how is that any different than any some humans that we know who are incredibly confident with misinformation? Well, that, that's true. I think we hope that it will be more accurate <laughs> since it's a computer and we're used to computers calculating sums correctly. But when it comes to a, a language model, I guess maybe we shouldn't expect anything better than what the human language that's trained on is in terms of accuracy. And, uh, you know, and that confidence is... Um, it could be problematic in the future because we already see, you know, a lot of misinformation being spewed on the web. Now, if somebody were to use chat GPT to make a semi, you know, um, structured argument against the facts, it makes their lives so much easier because, you know, the machine's doing it for them. Yeah. And as Luke mentioned, you can really ask it to create anything in any style and any format. You can say a serious blog post or a sassy commercial or a romantic song or poem or any combination of these that you may think of. So um, it's certainly possible to write something that sounds like a news article. And mm -hmm. if it's not been trained on that content, it might not produce correct facts in that news article while still reading as if it was a news article prepared, prepared by a professional reporter who hopefully does fact checking before they publish. So that's that's one big concern. Luke, what are some other weaknesses and limitations in chat GPT or GPT-3 or these large language models? Well, I, I think one of the biggest limitations is, you know, like we talked about being able to accurately um, portray factual information, perhaps, uh, perhaps that's the next uh, research topic for the folks at OpenAI. We need to build a generative model that gives some demurring um, phrases when it when it generates text if it's not actually confident in the in the right. content. It's like, well, I think, or maybe, or perhaps, you know, um, or it's possible that you know, add some add some phrases in there that actually denote that the model itself is not confident in the information it's giving. Um, but on top of that, you know depending on the type of information or type of content you're generating, say you're generating source code, for example, using a generative model, um, there's no real way to make sure that the code is correct. We can make sure code compiles, um, but you can't make sure that it actually does what you intend it to do. Um, in, in other cases, you know, you might want it to generate, um, you know, a report or something for your business. Say, you know, you're thinking as a, as a, a VP at a company or something like that, They're like this is going to save my folks so much time because it can generate all of these memos and reports for me using information that's fed to it. Well, 
someone's still going to have to go back in and verify all of that information because it's just going to start adding new new data. It's using what you provided as an inference, not as a template. It's not a mail merge. And so you can't trust that everything you ask it to put in in the response is actually going to be there. Um, so you, know, you still have to have humans in the loop doing things like verification, fact checking, and making sure that in the end, some human being is going to have to put their name or signature or whatever to whatever is generated by this GPT system. You need to be sure that what it generates is is correct, at least good enough that you're you're willing to put your name beside it. Luke, that's that's a great point. And I I just read an article two weeks ago about someone who shared how it saved them lots of time in preparing complex Excel macros. Now he he also admitted in the article that he had to go in and tweak and tune a few of the macros that didn't all do exactly what he intended with and thus produce correct results. But the complexity of the macros was so great that he thinks this is going to be a, a, a wonderful tool for him forever because now he's doing more validation and checking instead of from scratch creation of it. So I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's a powerful tool, especially when used in concert with people that are experts at validation and checking and uh, maybe massaging some of the output. So that's great. Now we have to read machine generated code. It's bad enough reading somebody else's <laughs> code. Uh, no, but, you know, uh, <laughs> um, no, but, but the point I was trying, I, I think that that you're right, Jay. I, I think uh, the true power in chat GPT or GPT-3 today is that it makes that first step, the first draft of a document or whatever you're trying to do incredibly fast because, you know, if you're, but it doesn't sort of, you know, save you from having to do the research. You have to do the research. It might help you create some arguments or a flow of a document that you could then revise and then revise again and again and produce something that's a lot better had you not had chat GPT, but in, you know, it, I, I still see it as a tool that, you know, will help us do more work, better work. Um, but it's not a replacement for, for any human uh, anytime soon. So, so what are some things you two think are going to be um, some applications of this next year? I mean, chat GPT wasn't released very long ago. We talked about the ideas in these uh, large language models. And more importantly, the ideas in machine learning have been around for a long time. But it seems like every week, we're seeing a new application or tool that does something incredibly exciting. It, the, the capabilities are growing exponentially. And that is, that's wonderful. And of course, predictions are very hard when things are changing exponentially. But what are some things that you expect to see companies or organizations or universities or individuals uh, doing with technologies like this in the year and uh, year ahead and maybe the next few years? So, okay, I've got one. Um, you know, even today, a lot of the news that you read, especially on sites like Bloomberg and things of that site, uh, are, are sort of auto-generated. And they will usually have a disclaimer at the bottom saying that, hey, this was auto-generated. But I want to point out one particular discrepancy that I thought that I hope that you know, Chat GPT three, GPT three, and it uh, you know, and its future versions might fix. And uh, you know, I was following the 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 euro to dollar conversion rate, and it was right after the, the European Central Bank had raised its interest rates. And the article read like you know, there was a jump in the dollar and the euro dollar rate, and it was due to the the the, the rising of the interest rates in Europe. And the next day, the rates fell. And it pretty much, you know, spit out the same piece of text saying that, you know, the rate fell and this was due to the ECB, you know, raising the interest rate. So again, so that's a limitation in the language model itself that it doesn't understand the impact or have a memory of what was said before. Uh, and it's, it, but, you know, I think that that's one of the things I'd like to see, you know, improve. I think that's a really funny example because transformer models themselves were actually created as a way of allowing these neural networks to store state, albeit at a much smaller level than remembering what happened yesterday. To be fair, I, I have plenty of days where I don't always remember what happened yesterday, but um, it, you know, that's what these transformer models were really designed for was so that it could 
it could generate language in such a way that it made sense because the the word that you use next is dependent on the word you used before. And so if you don't have that context in place, you can't generate anything that sounds um, halfway coherent. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that that's a that's a really interesting point that it it'll use the same argument <laughs> in in the inverse um, two days in a row. Yeah, I'm. Oh, go ahead, Adnan. Oh no, the other thing I was going to say is, um, you know, and again, this is just a limitation of the model as it stands today is that it doesn't produce mathematically uh, accurate arguments. It'll look great, but you know, they won't add up. And even for simple equations, right? And so it's 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 something that can be fixed, you know, fairly easily, I think. Um, and then the other thing that I've read is another limitation uh, which we need to overcome is, again, when you're generating code for all the programmers who are listening to this, yes, you can produce, you know, really good code that will compile um, using Chat GPT three, but. Uh, Again, because it's trained on existing code and you know what's available in GitHub and things of that sort, um, if there were any security vulnerabilities in that code, it'll sort of introduce them into your you know auto-generated code as well. So you've you've got to be careful. Yeah, I mean, I think that if our listeners get one thing out of this, I hope they or, or one concern out of this is that it's just not always right, no matter how good it sounds. So if you ask it to write a poem or lyrics or a script, there's no right or wrong. But if you ask it to do a news article or ask it to create some code or ask it to perform some mathematical operations, um, it is not yet at the point where it can automatically check itself and ensure that things are correct. So Luke's point about humans are still need to be in the loop for anything for which accuracy really matters. Although it's awful fun to play with right now for the the simple things it can do, um, I do want to point out we mentioned it earlier that uh, GPT three was trained on a 175 billion parameter model, and that adds a tremendous amount of complexity in the uh, neural network such that it can find lots of of patterns and and then generate uh, interesting results. GPT four will be released by OpenAI sometime in the next few years and they expect it to be trained on 100 trillion parameters. So that is a staggering increase in parameter count, which will hopefully lead to a tremendous increase in accuracy and hopefully what Luke said as well, um, uh, sharing the degree of confidence it has about the information it's trained on. So I, I hope that becomes part of it as well. Um, any final comments from you two before we close this episode out? You know, I think um, one thing I'll, I'll say going back to the topic on, on near-term applications of this, I think for most people, the, the most likely near-term application is in auto-generated responses, either email responses or text message responses. You know, we get those automatic, we get those already, you know, if you have a Gmail or you have iMessage or something like that, they'll generate a very short, brief response that it thinks is in the right, you know, emotional state for the, the text that you were just received, or it'll be an appropriate response to an email you received. But I think with a, a, a larger scale generative model like this, you'll finally see full responses auto-generated for email. And in the same way that you get these kind of one-line responses now, it'll be up to the user to say, oh, that's a fine response. I'm just going to select that um, or, you know, on text message or whatnot, or select, you know, fill it in and then edit it. But I think that's one of the first major uses you're going to see. And it's going to be completely transparent to people. You're not going to know that you're using a, a generative transformer under the covers in order to get that. In fact, you are now. That's what that's what the current system is. It's actually a very small generative transformer that's producing those text message responses, producing those email responses now on a much grander scale with more complexity. Of course, people will then have their own AIs. Google has started to pioneer this, the ability for an AI to act on your behalf when talking to a chat bot. So mm -hmm. I see a, a near future in which your own personal chat bot is interfacing with the chat bot of whoever you're seeking to purchase something for, or make a reservation, get some support, et cetera. So it's quite possible we're gonna have different chat bots talking to each other. 
And Absolutely. You know, it, they've created their own language and they're not even conversing in English anymore. <laughs> well, I, I just I just need all of my work email responses to be auto generated in the style of Taylor Swift lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my one final thought is, again, this is incredible. I think, you know, we're going to see a lot of benefit from it. My one concern is especially, you know, given how good it is, people are going to employ it by not completely understanding the implications or the ramifications of what it's capable of or, or, or its limitations are, right? Uh, you know, you already see businesses that are getting rid of human support as much as they can because it's, you know, costs a lot of money, you've got to train people and so on and so forth. And, you know, as as good as Chad GPT-3 is, it's still, um, you know, as somebody who, you know, who has had to deal with support issues, you know, you know, the ultimate sort of, a, a, you know, recourse that you have is I want to talk to somebody human, but you may not never know that, you know, you're still talking to a machine because today the gap is so big between, you know, what is machine generated versus, you know, yeah, you know, and a human, but chat GPT is just going to sort of blur those lines even more. And you may have some really disgruntled customers <laughs> with no way of reaching, you know, actual support. Yeah, I, I do well, worry about that, especially if your problem is unique and not something it's been trained on and you don't use words that help guide it to something. It's quite possible you end up in dead ends, even with a smart chat bot. Right. Yeah. Well, that's why, that's why everyone's going to just have to employ their own, you know, <laughs> AI personal assistant to answer the phone and talk to the bots for them. Just, just, hope that you don't end up with that two year subscription to the bacon of the month club or whatever it is you were trying to get out of because these things are going to run off the rails every once in a while you're going to end up giving authority to to this model that's going to make a decision for you um that you may not like so you just have to be sure not to let it you know automatically pull the trigger on your checkbook or anything like that well guys i want to thank you too for joining me today i always love talking to you and i'm I'm glad we get to share this conversation with our Austin Forum upload listeners to start 2023. We will be covering AI uh, extensively in April programming, but pretty consistently throughout the year in the Austin Forum events, podcasts, the new blog, which now I think we should ramp the blog with chat GPT writing the articles. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> and I, I wanted to share one fun example um, right before we all signed in today for this podcast, I decided to ask Austin Forum upload, I'm sorry, ask ChatGPT to write a haiku about the Austin Forum upload. And you might be wondering why I picked haiku and it's because, well, that's short enough that I could read it during the podcast. And I, I love the haiku that it generated. Tech talk fills the air, insightful conversations. Austin Forum thrives. Well, that was a perfect haiku for the conversation I expected to have with you two today. And I want to thank you both for being part of that and making that haiku true. Well, thanks for having us on, Jay. And next time we'll just have to add um, a, a, a text-to-speech model to the end of chat GPT and have it just generate the, the podcast for us. I would or, love to try that by the end of the year. <laughs> or have like a chat GPT host, you know, so that it's- sort Hey, of hey, hey, wait a second. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 well, not, no, I wasn't referring to you. I was referring to our, our participants. Sorry. That's that's the end goal, right? Full, pro <laughs> full, full economic productivity with half the work. There we go. Well, uh, thank you both. And really glad that we have the Austin Forum upload, sharing content again. Uh, stay tuned for a number of interesting new topics that we'll cover in the month and months ahead. And we look forward to sharing more content with you as part of the Austin Forum on Technology and Society. Thanks for listening to the Austin Forum Upload. You can listen to additional episodes and check out a schedule of our monthly in-person events at austinforum.org. The Upload is a production of the Austin Forum on Technology and Society, a nonprofit organization here in Austin, Texas.